Hi, I'm Jerry, and I'll be sharing some of my thoughts on death and the meaning of life. I've worked as a professor for over 43 years and as a software engineer for the past 50. My wife and I have bootstrapped three nonprofits in the areas of affordable housing, homeless prevention, and net positive photovoltaics. I'll be turning my attention to Crimson SIS, an accessible education startup, in the coming year. I'm also a social justice advocate working at the nexus of First Amendment rights and academic freedom, PTR appeals, constitutional law, and cyber policy. I'll begin with the evolution of my thinking about death, which Socrates analogizes to being like a dreamless sleep. It's a gentle way to look at it, and it resonates with me. I was born in 1957. Most of my early conceptions of death came from depictions of subdued characters in the cartoons that I watched on TV with X's in their eyes. They looked like they were asleep and seemed to resurrect in the subsequent episodes. And if you'd asked me, I'd have to say they were sleeping. This view was reinforced when my parents took me to the World's Fair in 1964. I saw Michelangelo's Pieta in the Vatican Pavilion, which depicts Jesus laying on Mary's lap after the crucifixion. It seemed quite relaxed and I tried to affect that pose after swimming by draping myself over lounge chairs. Coincidentally, there was a convent bordering our property, and the nuns paused to stare at me on several occasions. They might have thought I was mocking them, but it was all quite innocent. Things changed when my grandmother died. She had a German accent, was quite stern, and I was a little afraid of her. She'd bend down, tell me how cute I was, pinch my cheek, and then give it a twist. It was excruciating. She'd then make her way over to the chopped liver pate, scoop the majority of it in one fell swoop on a cracker, leaving scraps for me and my sister. When my mother sat me and my sister down to inform us that our grandmother had died, I was actually somewhat relieved. I sensed the gravity of the situation a little bit because my mom was crying, but I imagined grandma with X's in her eyes sprawled out like Jesus and in a deep sleep. When she said we'd never see her again, I figured she was taking a seriously long nap that I'd no longer have to endure the pain of having my cheeks canurled and there'd be open season on the chicken liver. The next formative event for me was the Kennedy assassination. My cartoons were interrupted by an emergency broadcast. I remembered the chase car video following Kennedy's vehicle to the hospital. I sensed something serious was up, but was relieved when my cartoons resumed. It was a day or two later when my cartoons were interrupted yet again by the transfer of Lee Harvey Oswald to prison. I was watching in real time when Jack Ruby shot him and vividly recall the look on Oswald's face. That was the first time I associated guns, pain, and death. I wasn't at my grandmother's funeral, but did attend my grandfather's viewing a few years later. That was the first time I saw a corpse and realized it wasn't breathing. I couldn't imagine holding one's breath, let alone forever. The next time I draped myself over a lounge chair, I tried holding my breath as long as I could. It was only then I was met with the revelation, shit, this can't be good. Turning now to Daster's notions regarding death, I'd have to say that she's delineated a few useful framings. Sparing the details, I've had a number of near-death experiences. I've run out of air while scuba diving at a depth of 85 feet. I've been shot in the leg. 
I've been nearly decapitated while taking pictures on a riverboat in Russia, ducking a fraction of a second before passing under the arch of a bridge. I've survived two car crashes where I was rear-ended. Being the founder of a non-profit residential recovery network, I've dealt with overdoses, stumbled on suicides, and sat bedside in hospice. I've also suffered the loss of close family members in accidents. Previously, I naively thought of life as a continuum, unbounded on the left and terminated at some hopefully far off time to the right by an event called death. Dastor has gotten me to thinking of death more as a transition point. To that, I would add that I now view birth as an equally important boundary point. Ironically, I now view birth as the end of non-existence and death as the beginning of non-existence. Let me add the caveat right here that religious people don't think of the region to the right as an area of non-existence. That's a comforting thought and accommodatable. Life then is that range between birth and death. The value of seeing birth and death as boundary points is that it gives us perspective on life as an area of change. What's important is what we do in the interim. It's like an assignment with a start date and if you'll forgive the expression, a deadline. Now, Dastor views death as a stressor, anticipation of which causes a state of anxiety that can ruin one's life unless dealt with. The coping mechanism she describes riffs on Socrates' take, that being the realization that death is inevitable and that there's nothing we can really do about it. The process of making that realization is deemed to her to be therapeutic. Socrates pans death and informs us that once we vacuously stop worrying about it, we can concentrate on learning to live. I prefer Socrates' characterization. The expression, learning to live, denotes a pedagogical process rather than therapy. The reason I think therapy is the wrong notion is that I don't feel that everyone harbors a pervasive, omnipresent fear of death. In fact, I think most Gen Xers and Millennials have yet to acknowledge it. Pedagogy can be didactic, employing a teacher, or autodidactic, meaning independent study. So let's focus on life. Pedagogy consists of a set of learning activities, resources, assessments, and dispositional frameworks. You can be Sartrean about it and just let things happen as they may, or proactive and maximize your potential. You can go to school or undertake independent study. Most people have exposure to learning activities, resources, and assessments. I'll mention a few to tickle your memory. Let's substitute in classwork or homework for learning activities, books for resources, and tests for assessments. What I want to focus on here, which I think is too often under-addressed, is dispositional frameworks. I think that's where philosophy comes in, as a disposition is a way of thinking about things. I'll share out my dispositional framework, which is ever in draft form and subject to ongoing revision. You can go about forming up your own. Reading lots of philosophy helps. I'll start with Maslow's hierarchy, which I've flattened into a table because I don't think it's right to call it a hierarchy. It consists of two sets of things, basic felt needs and higher felt needs. Basic needs are the essentials you need just to get by, food, clothing, shelter, etc. Higher felt needs are the things you do for a living. The buzzword for that these days is self-actualization. I've added a couple of more things to my dispositional framework. I think it's important for us to have relationships. Scott Galloway tells us that happiness itself is a function of the number of relationships you form with friends and family members. Google him for more on that. 
I've appropriated Aristotle's classification of friendships for my purposes. He classifies friendships by their utility, pleasure, and virtue. Utility denotes a business acquaintance. Pleasure denotes someone you hang out with, but might draw the line at living with. Virtue means somebody you'd marry. Maslow and Aristotle give us useful fictions to live by. They do seem to frame useful criteria for getting by, but maybe you need God in your life, something more faith-based. Climate is another consideration. You may be a snow freak, a cold weather person. I'm a beach freak. That doesn't imply going in the water. I'm culturally Jewish. We're desert people. That's why we parted the Red Sea. I'm happiest in the summer and repair full tilt boogie to warmer climes at the first hint of snow. Finally, I don't want to come across as too secular here. Perhaps your soul will survive and the stars in the heavens are loved ones looking down upon us. I'm too much of a skeptic for that. But I do think it's important to leave a legacy even if that reduces to having a succession plan. After all, you don't want someone to get stuck picking up the tap for your funeral now, do you? <laughs>